Hi, my name is Aron Horvat. Welcome to the video in which we will get into the implementation of the list of T generic class in C Sharp and see how it is implemented under the hood. If you like what you learn in this video, please subscribe to my channel. Don't forget to tick the bell so that you receive notifications when new videos are published. This video is related to the course, the video course, which I have published at Pluralsight recently, titled Collections and Generics in C-Sharp 10. Follow the link from the description and watch that video course. You will see the use of collections in realistic business applications, many different kinds of collections used in many different settings. There's also an in-depth coverage of generics in that course, especially on using and constructing custom covariant and contravariant types. The course ends in designing and implementing your custom collections when the existing collections fail. In the previous video, you have learned how the list is working under the hood by reallocating a common array and copying multiple times the content of the array so that there is always sufficient capacity to receive more and more items as we add them. In this video, I will implement the list so that you can see that mechanism at work. Please follow the link from the description if you need to watch the previous video in which we have explained how that mechanism of reallocating and copying data works and be advised that in that video we have also entailed a formula which shows how fast this mechanism is compared to using a common array without reallocating it. So we have calculated the performance, the CPU performance of the list. In this video, I will just implement a new list class all the way through. It will expose two constructors, one receiving the desired capacity. So if you know how many items you are expecting on input and don't want to pay that extra cost of reallocating the array inside the list, then just give it the capacity right away. On the inside, the content of the list will be stored in the common array. And we know that we are going to reallocate it from time to time, so there will be a setter as well. Both getter and setter are private. When the time comes to initialize the list, we will just initialize the content array to its capacity, and the parameterless constructor will assume some capacity. I have put value 16 here, because I'm playing smart and pretending I know that people will always add data to the list. Actually, the list from .NET Framework has capacity zero, initially, if you don't specify any. So if you just instantiated the list, new list, it will have capacity zero and it will take no memory at all for the data. It's up to you to decide when you are implementing a collection like this. Then, list is exposing the capacity property getter. What is the capacity of the list? Well, that's the size of the array as it is allocated right now. But also, there is the count, how many items there are really in the list. Well, that is the count we will maintain. So there will be a private setter and a public getter and initially the count will be zero. There will be nothing inside the list, no matter what the capacity is. There's also the indexer, which is mapping an index into the item on get and setting the appropriate element of the array on set. How does the getter work? That is a tricky question here, because we cannot just get into the array and return whatever there is. We must check whether the index is lower than the count. We must not allow the caller to address part of the array beyond count. That part of the array is just for us. It is unused and the caller must not address it. So if the caller attempted to address element beyond the last populated element of the array, even though that index would be valid index into the array, 
we must throw an exception. I will just refactor this code a bit because I need this validation in the setter as well. The setter will be based on the same principle, it will only set a valid index into the array. So those are the public properties of the list. What about other members, like adding an item, removing from the specified index, or ensuring capacity? These are the three most prominent public methods of the list. Ensure capacity is a very interesting one. You have learned that the cost of resizing is a factor of to the factor that applies to time required to populate the list compared to populating an array. Adding items costs us a lot unless we know the capacity, unless we know how many items we are expecting to come. So ensure capacity method is a very useful one if you need to optimize the speed of the list when you use it. How do we implement add? First, Ensure that there is room for one more element by using the ensure capacity method. Then just set the item and move the counter one element to the right. How do we remove an item? We copy everything beyond that item until the last used element in the array. We copy it one element to the left. Well, that is a wasteful operation, really. That could be a wasteful operation if there were many items beyond the one that is removed and just reduce the counter by one. Now, compare cost of adding and removing. Add has an amortized complexity O of 1. It costs you constant time on average. Sometimes, if you're not lucky, it could cost you the time proportional to number of items in the list right now. That is the count property. So, for example, if you use a huge list in a real-time system, then sometimes you could see a glitch because you were waiting for the list to reallocate and copy the entire content into the new array. So, if you are using a list in the real-time system, you will not be able to assume that the cost of add is constant. Sometimes it will be proportional to the size of the list. On the other hand, the cost of remove in general is O of M. So that is a tragic member. You don't call it unless you know precisely what you're doing. For example, you, you can see already that removing an item would be cheap when removing an item from the list's end or very close to the list's end. But if you try to always remove the first item in the list, then every remove operation will be proportional to the current size of the list. So the conclusion is, use add as much as you like. That's what, that, that is the, the core purpose of the list. That's why the list was made for us. But don't use remove at, not until you know that there are no more efficient ways to, to accomplish your operation or at least that you are removing an item that is close to the end of the list, which could happen also when the list is very small and everything is close to its end. All right, ensuring capacity. How do we ensure capacity? Well, first, if capacity is already sufficient, then terminate. Don't do anything. Otherwise, multiply existing capacity by two or at least one, because capacity could be zero. But also, the new capacity could be way larger than current capacity. So while we reach what was required, we keep multiplying by two. So, so the new capacity will exponentially grow until it passes or reaches the requested capacity. And then we repeat that protocol of allocating the new array, copying the content up to count elements, not to the entire existing array, but only the used portion of it, and replacing the array with a new content, making the new array official. And that is it. This is the crux of the list. We could implement anything else you like. The entire public interface of the list class is very easy to implement. Like, I don't know, clear. How do we clear the list? 
reduce counter to zero. How do we sort it? Well, ask the array, please sort this underlying array, but only the count elements of it, not the entire array, because part of the array could be unused. Sorting using a comparer, just pass it to the array. Or, I don't know, how do we for each the list? Just for each through the list's own enumerator and apply the action to every item. Which reminds me that the enumerator implementation is missing. How do we get the enumerator? By yield returning every item in the populated part of the array. We, we can implement everything else that is missing from the public uh, API of the list. But we don't have to. You have got the point. Meticulously pass everything to the array, only making sure to never address anything beyond count, because beyond count is the unused part of the array, and we do not let the outer caller do anything to those items. Do you want to expose the list as a span? Piece of cake. Use the same technique as before, just pass it to the array. You can keep going, implement all the missing elements of the list if you like. This is the working principle of the list. And we can finally demonstrate how it works. For example, here I'm using the common list. I can substitute my list in place of it, run the application, and you will see that all the data will be there. Everything is working the same. So, in this video, you have learned how you can implement a full collection of data when you have a working principle that is not implemented in some other collection. It is not complicated. Again, if you want to learn more, watch my course on collections and generics in C-sharp at Plural site, where I'm even developing some very complicated data structures on top of the collections that already exist in .NET. I hope you liked this demonstration. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.